So we're making our way to another iconic area of the Antietam battlefield here. And as you can see behind me, this is Burnside's Bridge. And we're gonna learn how just a single regiment on the Confederate side was able to hold off a far superior force from the Union. Wow, absolutely beautiful. So right off the bat, you can see the hill on the other side of the bridge here. And uh, it's a pretty imposing position. It's easy to see how a small band of soldiers perched on top of that hill here can uh, wreak havoc on forces trying to cross the bridge. You can see just how narrow that bridge is. So you're trying to advance across a couple hundred men at a time. It's probably going to be pretty slow. On top of, the men are beginning to fall here. So now you have to jump over their bodies. You have the wounded you have to jump over and perch the high on the... Uh, hill here on the other side, so you get on the other side of this tree, so you can see, is the Confederate forces. Now, straight ahead in front of us, you would have the 20th Georgia perched high on this mountain here, mountain or hill, everything's mountains to me, remember I'm from Florida, and through the brush here, you would have elements of the 2nd Georgia. So you had two infantry regiments perched high up on the uh, heights here. And uh, they were in charge of slowing down the Union advance here. Now, trying to advance across this bridge would be Burnside's forces, which would be the 9th Corps. And he would try and coordinate a multi-prong crossing here. He would have forces cross the bridge here. And further this way, I think maybe southeast is this direction, um, Union engineers found a low point in the Antietam Creek here. So he would have a force attempting to cross there. Well, unfortunately, he didn't anticipate the stiff resistance that he would meet in this area, and progress would be pretty slow. Now, the bridge here wasn't always called Burnside Bridge. I believe it was called Lower Bridge, and the waterway you're seeing here is the Antietam Creek. And they had several bridges crossing this area. I believe you had Middle Bridge and maybe Upper Bridge, and this would be Lower Bridge, which after the battle, it would take on the name Burnside's Bridge. So right around 10 a.m., the 11th Connecticut would begin assaulting this position. Now, at around 10 a.m., the Union troops also began assaulting the sunken lane here on the other side of the battlefield. And supporting the 11th Connecticut was the entirety of Crook's Brigade. Well, unfortunately, due to some confusion and probably miscommunication, most of his brigade would emerge from the wood line here, far past Burnside's Bridge. And they would be pinned down by Confederate fire and the 11th Connecticut would be left here all alone. And obviously, as you can tell, that didn't fare very well. And just to kind of give you a layout of the plan here, so you had the 11th Connecticut would charge the bridge head on and you had Crook's Brigade, which would emerge far north of the Burnside Bridge here. And then you had Nagel's Brigade, which would attempt to take this area uh, second after the 11th Connecticut failed. And just like the first attempt, Nagel's Brigade would be pinned down here and suffer heavy casualties. And we'll make our way back over to the bridge here. It doesn't seem like a far way to go, but remember, under Confederate fire from these heights, crossing this bridge, which is now full of casualties, you're stepping over your comrades, trying to push forward, and you can see just how narrow it is. This is what I'd like to call a fatal funnel. You have a large body of men being funneled into a small area. Maybe this bridge is, I don't know, eight to 10 feet wide. And up above the heights here, the Confederates had easy targets because there's no concealment here. And even if you stop to take refuge on the side of the bridge here, you're still exposed from this side. Holy smokes, I don't know how I almost missed this, but you see this giant tree? Look at it, it goes all the way up. Well, this tree was here and witnessed Burnside's attack here on the bridge in the heights beyond. How cool is that? And here you have a picture just post Battle of Antietam here. And you can see the, I believe it's a sycamore tree. And here it is today. Wow, that is pretty cool. Now they put this fence up because they obviously want to preserve this as long as possible. So they ask that you observe it from afar. Wow, how cool is that? So after two failed Union attempts here, the third and eventually successful attack on the bridge was made by General Faro's veteran brigade. 
the 51st New York and the 51st Pennsylvania and they were called the twin 51s but they would finally successfully drive the Confederates from these heights here. Now in total both infantry regiments had about 650 men and they charged down the hill directly towards the bridge and at first Confederate resistance was pretty strong and they were losing men at an alarming pace but with ammunition running low on the, for the Confederate forces on the heights Toombs men retreated as Union soldiers finally captured this critical Antietam bridge crossing at around 1 p.m. So it took about three hours for the forces here to finally secure this bridge. So one thing that I always seem to forget to think about is what do they do with the dead once the armies leave the area? Well, you see the stone wall before us here. That is where they buried many of the men who died attacking the bridge here. And they used the wood from the top of the bridge for their headstones. Now they've obviously since been re-exhumed from this location, but the stone wall before you at its base stood many of the men who were killed here. You always hear the term a divided nation during the Civil War and, and brother versus brother and family versus family. Well, that was actually the case here at Burnside Bridge. The man on the left is Union Colonel Henry W. Kingsbury, and he was wounded four times assaulting this position. And the man on the right was General Jones and his soldiers were part of the division that was defending the uh, heights here for the Confederates. All right, so we backed up from Burnside Bridge a tad. You can probably see it through the clearing right there. That's where we started from. So we backed up and this is the ground that the 11th Connecticut would have come through as they were making their assault on Burnside Bridge. Now the left in the center of the lines would reach the banks of the river here and their right flank would reach the level ground between here and the bridge. And the 11th Connecticut would be chewed up pretty good. And they'd suffer 139 killed and wounded in this area trying to uh, assault Burnside Bridge here. Ooh. It is a warm one here today at Antietam, but completely worth it. Absolutely beautiful area. All right, so we've seen this battle from the Union's point of view. Now let's uh, head up to the high ground here and see what this battle would have looked like from the Confederates' point of view. Jeez, as I walk back this way, you can just see how uh, intimidating this would have been crossing. Hmm. All right, so we've made our way to the high ground here at Burnside Bridge, and oh gosh, wow. And here's the position where the Confederates, I believe numbering less than 500, would have manned this position here. And you can see just what an easy target the Union troops crossing the bridge here would have been. Wow. Now probably a lot of this foliage wasn't here either. But we mentioned that the Confederates had two regiments here manning this bridge, numbering right around 500. And almost 5,500 Union troops were assaulting this position. So even though the uh, Confederates had a fraction of the number that the Union did, they were still able to uh, hold this area for several hours. And here's just a different map. You can see Burnside's 9th Corps crossing Burnside Bridge here. And he would send a brigade to cross this shallow fort here. Now once this force would cross the fort around 1 o'clock, that's when the Confederates from this location, already running low on ammunition, would pull back towards the town of Sharpsburg here. I thought this was pretty interesting. It's always neat seeing uh, pictures post-battle here, and that's what the Burnside Bridge would have looked like here. You can see some of the damage, possibly some of these wood pieces used as headstones like we found out earlier. And here's a few other images of Burnside Bridge here. You have the famous illustration in 1888, and look, a postcard from the 30s has a car driving across it. And you can see on the other side of the bridge there by the New York Monument that we saw, it's a parking lot. And the bridge has endured several floods as well. But ultimately, we were finally able to preserve this bridge. Now I believe that at one point the bridge was damaged by flooding, um, but this is just beautiful ground that we can continue to learn from. Now before we wrap up here today, it's important to note that this wasn't the only fighting on this section of the battlefield. After a lengthy delay, 
Burnside was finally able to move the rest of his 9th Corps across the bridge here and they would push towards the town of Sharpsburg where they were driving back the Confederates and they were this close to victory. But fresh off their victory at Harper's Ferry, Confederate reinforcements would converge and uh, pretty much keep the Union troops from advancing any further. Um, again, this is just a brief snapshot of a few sections of the battlefield here at Antietam, which was the single bloodiest day in American history. Still the single bloodiest day. Um, I hope you enjoyed this one, and I hope that this perspective here kind of sheds some light as to why this area of the battlefield was just so deadly. And as always, catch you on the next one.